Today's webinar is the part three of the respective physiology lectures, which were going on in the last two sessions. And today we're going to wind up the respective physiology. And today's faculty is a mixed faculty. I mean, one from the senior group, Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram, one from the intermediate group, Dr. Ramdas, and one from the youngsters, Dr. Sanesh. And since Dr. Reminder Sagar, who is supposed to moderate this session, she is not able to join because she is not getting the connection through to the webinar, I will be showing in, in place of her. And the speakers, as I said, are Meenakshi, Ramdas, and Sanesh. Let me take the pressure of introducing Meenakshi Sundaram to you all. It is my pressure to introduce Meenakshi Sundaram. Meenakshi Sundaram is the dean and principal at one of the government medical colleges in Tamil Nadu. I'm really going to fail in my ability to introduce Meenakshi to you all. Meenakshi is such a very big person. As we say in Tamil, a Periya Manadan. Meenakshi is an excellent clinician. He's a real academic professor. Over to that. He's a good orator. Well, people may be knowing that he's a good orator, but more than that, he's a good Tamil poet. And he used to participate, as he participates in anesthesia conferences, he goes for Tamil literature groups. And he's a regular or an yearly visitor to USA to participate in the Tamil literature festival going on in USA. And he used to have a lot of poems written by him, son, and the poets discussion there in the USA. There in USA, as well as in India. And he's an authority on most of the epics in Hindu mythology, Ramayana, Bhagavada, Bharatam, all these things. And he writes out all these things and makes comments out of these things. And over to all these things, he's the best doctor selected by the state of Tamil Nadu. And he's the best teacher selected by the University of MDR Tamil Nadu. And over to all, he's a real good gentleman. With these simple ways, I request Meenakshi Sundaram to have your lecture on the topic assigned you. Thank you, Meenakshi, for joining us. Dr. Sanish, is it okay? Yeah, it's fine. Dr. Okay. Sanish? Fine. Is it okay? Yes, yes. You can go ahead, sir. Uh, respected uh, Dr. B. Radhakrishnan, uh, who has given me the opportunity with his team for me to present this uh, lecture on pulmonary function test. Thanks for your elaborate introduction, sir. And I am happy to see that you have included me in the senior faculty list. Um, so I thank you very much for that. Now, I am going to give a lecture on uh, pulmonary function tests and its implications, which is uh, a foundation which I am going to lay on which Dr. Sanish will build up pillars and Dr. Ramdas will construct a building over it. So now I'm as I am going to concentrate on the foundation, I could not uh, give jokes or uh, any diversions in that because this pulmonary function tests and its implication for anesthesiologists are mandatory to everyone to know. So I am straight away going into the lecture. It's not moving as I said, Sanish. So, yeah, first of all, I want to tell all the audience that the pulmonary function test is construed as spirometry. But actually, it is not uh, restricted to spirometry. It should involve the whole of the 
respiratory system evaluation so in addition to physical examination this x ray and arterial blood gases are to be construed as pulmonary function tests so what the pulmonary function test measures it measures the lung volume it measures the lung capacity it measures the rate of flow of gases inside the tubercular tree and also the gas exchange so what they provide so they provide important information relating to the airways that is tracheobronchial tree as well as small airways in addition to the pulmonary parenchyma so the size and integrity of the pulmonary capillary bed also will be known by doing a pulmonary function test but i want to can give Air process. It will lead you to some area. Then we have to diagnose. It will not point out. Volume loops. As they they guide us, they guide us to some diagnosis. Particular diagnosis. So the. Respiratory lung parenchymal function and no pressure and the mechanics are helped by a PV one, which I will come later. Uh, mandatory ventilation and this residual volume, uh, total lung capacity ratio and the capacity. So the lung parenchymal function would be assessed by the diffusion of the lung for carbon monoxide and pao2 and pso2 cardio pulmonary reserve can be assessed by vo2 max and the exercise spo2 so you have to go with the, all the tests to locate a diagnosis so when the pulmonary function tests will be indicated it is indicated when the patient is suffering from signs and symptoms of any lung pathology and you can use it for early screening and you can analyze the improvement in the patient's condition by the treatment and for a preoperative evaluation for a major surgery like abdominal thoracic surgery it can be used but pulmonary function test should not be done in some areas that is if a patient has suffered from myocardial infarction within one month or unstable angina recent thoracic abdominal or ophthalmic surgery and if the patient is If we are going to ask in this room, we are not supposed to do pulmonary function test. And in current pneumothorax also, we are not supposed to do the testing. So, how to perform the pulmonary function test? Pulmonary function test can be performed in the standing position, but ideally sitting position is preferred because if the patient develops a syncope, the injury will be less. But If a patient is subjected to pulmonary function test, we have to instruct the patients not to smoke at least one hour before testing, and not to have a large meal so that they will be dyspneic, and not to wear a tight-fitting cloth. A tight jeans is allowed, but not a tight T-shirt, which will interfere with the pulmonary function test. So, if a patient is having a denture, it needs to be removed. We are doing during anesthesia. but if the if you feel that it is interfering with the patient's cooperation it could be removed but it is not mandatory so spirometry is a simple and a quick procedure to perform it is very simple because the patient is going maximal inspiration and he is going to expel the air as long and as quickly as possible which is called a most wide capacity maneuver so it measures the fev fvc and the ratio then comes the flow volume curves because the post graduates mainly they concentrate on that volume and the capacity but they will forget about flow volume curves so what i have planned first i will concentrate on flow volume curve then we will go for the capacities and the volumes which they know so this flow volume curve is produced when a patient performs a inspiratory maneuver so a graph will be produced so the positive side upper side will be the expiratory limb and a negative inspiratory limb it measures the peak expiratory flow rate also as well as 
the FEF 25 to 75 percent, which is independent of the patient's function, and it gives good information about the small airways. So this is the normal flow volume curve. So this is the expiratory limb, and this is the inspiratory limb, negative limb. So what happens in pathology? So this is the curve in COPD. See, this is the normal area which looks like a straight line, the expiratory limb. Here, the expiratory limb is either concave shaped because of the obstruction. Again, the expiratory flow itself is reduced, which means the patient is having obstructive pathology, but inspiration is relatively normal, but the volume is diminished. So what is happening actually in the pathology, when there is a reduced expiratory flow in the airways, it typically have a concave appearance. So if the flow volume loop morphology is normal, but a reduction in PEFR gives an indication that minimal airway obstruction is there. So in the flow volume curve in restrictive lung disease, so see the restrictive lung disease, the expiratory limb is more or less normal by the morphology, but instead of a straight line, it is a convex. So concave will be obstructive and convex will be restrictive. So in the restrictive lung disease, the expiratory limb is a convex, see the convex. So here the problem relates to a parenchymal disorder, whereas in obstructive pathology, the lesion relates to the airways. Here it is the parenchymal pathology. Then if there is an intrathoracic obstruction, I will give a clue for the residents. If there is an intrathoracic, if an eye comes, the problem will be in the expiratory limb. In the ventilator, we used to keep a IE ratio. So if it is I, problem is in E. If it is E, problem is in I. That is the clue. So if it is an intrathoracic obstruction, see the expiratory limb is affected. The expiratory limb is affected the, because normally in expiration, there will be an increase in intrathoracic pressure, which is transmitted to the intrathoracic airway, causing some narrowing of the airways. So when the patient is having an intrathoracic obstruction, because of the increase in pressure, the obstruction will be worsened. So the expiratory limb will be shortened. So it will not be a straight line, it will be like this, but the inspiration is more or less normal in intrathoracic obstruction. So what happens in extrathoracic? As I said, the extrathoracic produces problem in the inspiratory limb. That, that curve actually, the same curve has come. It produces problem in the inspiratory limb because the airflow is limited in both directions. This graph indicates only intrathoracic. Then if there is a static volume and a capacity, we should have the capacity to understand volumes in spirometry. That's what I want to say. Then people will be thinking why this four has come. There are four volumes and four capacities. So we have to remember this four. So what happens in the lung volumes? Static lung volumes are measured by the plethysmography. So they cannot be measured by spirometry. That I want to say. So a lung volume, if it is to be measured, it should be done by a plethysmograph or nitrogen washout or helium dilution technique. So the body plethysmography is a very simple principle actually. The patient sits in an airtight box, inhales or exhales to a particular volume, then a shutter drops. So the patient makes a respiratory efforts close to shutter. If the patient's chest wall expands, there is a reduction in the volume of the box. That is how it is measured. So the static lung volumes can be obtained either by measuring the change in pressure in a constant volume box or volume in a constant pressure box. So it is very simple if you remember the Boyle's law. Then comes the residual volume. The residual volume is the amount of air remaining in the lungs after maximal expiration. So in obstructive lung disease, residual volume is significantly increased, everyone knows. So the patients with high residual volume who require surgery and mechanical ventilation, they require high perioperative inflation pressure. As they require high perioperative inflation pressure, 
there is a chance of barotrauma and a pneumothorax and infection. So the residual volume can even be expressed as a percentage of total lung capacity, which is uh, for the anesthesiologist it mandatory to know because volume in excess of 140%, then the risk of complications like barotrauma and the infection and the pneumothorax are increased. So if the values are in excess of 180% of the predicted, they should be subjected for the lung reduction surgeries. Then comes the total lung capacity. It is the total volume of air in the lungs after a maximal inspiration. It is total. So it may be increased in patients with obstructive defects like emphysema, and it is reduced in the chest wall abnormalities like hypospoliosis. So FRC is the volume of air in the lungs following normal expiration. FRC is the main thing for the anesthesiologist as it produces um, if the FRC is less, then desaturates very early during anesthesia. And the FRC, the main principle behind FRC is it helps the oxygenation during the time of expiration. That is the role of FRC. When the patient inspires, the gas exchange occurs, but when the patient expires, only the FRC oxygenates the patient. So the FRC is mandatory. And if it is reduced, then the desaturation is faster. Then we have to assess the respiratory muscle function, which is also a principle of uh, this pulmonary function uh, test. Because in Gulenberry syndrome, the vital capacity falls, if it falls below one liter, mechanical ventilation is to be done. So, uh, lung volume, lung capacity, flow volume flow, and respiratory muscle function all are coming under pulmonary function tests. Then we have to go for AVG, bedside pulmonary function test, and overnight oximetry, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and white heart catheterization. They also come under pulmonary function testing. So, in the conclusion, what I want to conclude, the pulmonary function tests are an important tool. I have omitted this uh, bedside pulmonary function test because there are so many bedside pulmonary function tests called uh, Sabresis, Prathold uh, test, then Snyder's match blowing uh, test. Then we can auscultate over the trachea with the stethoscope. Then we can ask the patient to count from 1 to 30. So if the patient counts up to 30 or 40, then it is considered as uh, normal. And the sabresis breath holding test, if he could hold more than 30 seconds, then it will be good. Bedside pulmonary function test is also a pulmonary function test. And at last, it comes the handheld spirometry. So they are also input the evaluation of patient prior to major surgery. These decisions are typically made by anesthetists. See, the pulmonologist and the intensive care physician can help, can help the anesthetist to decide, but the decision is to be taken by anesthetist only. So, the interpretation of the test, which requires knowledge of normal volumes and appearance of flow volume flows, must be combined with the patient's clinical history and the presentation. I want to stress because only with the pulmonary function test, we should not go for any conclusion. It should be coupled with the clinical history and the presentation. Then in the volume, the volume of information which we should know, the tidal volume, it is a volume of air normally moves in and out of the lungs. Inspiratory reserve volume is the volume of air which we can inhale after a normal inspiration by force. Same way the expiratory reserve volume after normal expiration, how much we exhale by forcibly that is expiratory reserve volume. So the residual volume is the amount of air remaining in the lungs after maximal exhalation. After normal exhalation, it is FRC. After forcible exhalation, it is residual volume. Now I want all the residents to concentrate on this curve because even the quiz questions will be based on this only. This is vital. See, this is actually tidal volume. This is tidal volume. So after the tidal volume, the patient inspires more. So this area is called as inspiratory reserve volume. Then it is, is coming. This is the normal exhalation. After normal exhalation, he forcibly exhales. 
forcible exhalation is expiratory reserve volume. So after forcible expiratory reserve volume, the balance is the residual volume. So the whole thing is total lung capacity. And this is vital capacity. Vital capacity, the forcible inspiration, the forcible expiration. Now you should know this VC and this residual volume comprises total lung capacity. Same way, the FRC, functional residual capacity, and the inspiratory capacity, they contribute to total lung capacity. Here, the ERV, the tidal volume, and inspiratory reserve volume, they constitute a vital capacity. So, this graph, you please even think you can take a screenshot of it. You recollect the points available in this, then the lung volume, the capacity will be easy for the postgraduates to understand. So, our capacity, vital capacity, as I said, it is IRV plus TV. Inspiratory capacity is tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume. Functional residual capacity is expiratory reserve volume and uh, residual volume. And the total lung capacity is inspiratory capacity and FRC. I will again show the graph. See, this is the graph. We are giving only explanation for this. So, these are all the guideline values. Guideline values for the adult because usually the children will not cooperate for pulmonary function test. So, the guideline values are given for adults only. So here, even in this volume, the obstructive and the restrictive disease comes. This is a normal uh, area. So now in the obstructive, see the residual volume is more, but the expiratory reserve volume is very less. But here, what happens, the inspiratory reserve volume is less in the restrictive pathology. Residual volume is also reduced. So, this spirometric graph just for this APF 20 by 75, I have given this is a timed vital capacity. Actually, this FEV1 is essential in diagnosing the obstructive lung diseases. And this FEF 20 by 75, that is during the exhalation, the middle two quarters they constitute 25 to 75. So, this gives this is as it is patient independent, effort independent, it is the early sign of a obstructive pathology. So this is the time to vital capacity, the patient has to expire before 6 seconds. So this is FPV1 and this is the third second FPV3. Now these are all the explanations which I have already given, this FPF25, this maximum mid expiratory flow rate, MMEFR is the vital thing as it is patient independent. Again, I want to stress on that only. Now I can give some graphs for, for easy understanding. So this is a normal graph. See that the FEV1, this much the patient exhales. This much the patient exhales even in first second. Then immediately the plateau comes. So here the FEV1, FEC ratio is 0.8, which is a normal ratio. So again, what happens in obstructive pathology? In obstructive pathology, the FEV1 is vastly reduced. But FVC is more or less normal. So what happens? The FEV1, FVC ratio is reduced. It is reduced, whereas in restrictive lung disease, it may be normal or increased. So that is the difference. So in restrictive lung disease, what happens? The FEV1 is nearly 2 liters, but the FVC is reduced. So the ratio becomes nearly 1. Or so if the ratio is increased or it is normal, if it is reduced, it is obstructive lung pathology. In case if it is mixed, mixed obstructive and restrictive disorder is there, both the things will be present. FEV1 will be reduced, FVC will be reduced, but the ratio will be decreased. So, when everything is decreased, it is a mixed pathology, but the mixed pathology should not be diagnosed only by graph. Full respiratory function has to be analyzed if you want to diagnose mixed obstructive and restrictive pathology. These graphs are essential in answering multiple choice questions in the entrance exams. So, this is the spirometry. When the obstruction, there is a slow rise and 
it receives pass release but the plateau is uh, low when it is mixed both the things will be low so over in loop actually this i want to say this maximum voluntary ventilation so the patient has to breathe rapidly for 12 seconds so in copd it will be reduced Fine for anesthesia because it is used to assess the airway resistance and small airway absorption, and it is a parameter which is used to assess the efficacy of bronchodilation and diffusion capacity. It is the ability of the lungs to transport inhaled gases from alveoli to the red blood cells. So the normal will be twenty to thirty ml per minute. so it is a single breath test using carbon monoxide because patient inspires a dilute mixture of carbon monoxide and holds the breath for 10 seconds then it is analyzed by infrared monoxide it is decreased when whenever anemia alcohol issues this pulmonary capillary increase is increased in increased blood or pulmonary blood volume so that is the end of uh, my lecture i thank once again uh, the indian college of anesthesiologists for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you dr minesh sundaram for making a simple presentation on the pulmonary function test dr sanish for you to take over uh, sir we need to take the uh, audience quiz audience ah. quiz okay so now you tell me which of the following is equal to residual volume audience only 15 seconds you give or 10 seconds okay fine so the poll window is on closing the poll in another 5 seconds yes sir uh, closing the poll there this is the result sir option b right answer so 76% answered that so i think uh, i have delivered some message in that way i can happy but actually the audience are already intelligent it seems so they have answered very well right good b is the right answer next okay. question i'll share the poll window now <coughs> so which of the following is equal to inspiratory capacity i'm closing the poll now we'll wait for one or two more seconds closing now i think on, only limited people are answering it will be better if everybody shares their answer so this is the response again this uh, b is the right answer so the 46% have answered again i think uh, majority has given the right answer moving on to the third question i think i'll uh, read out the question because some of you uh, joining using mobile devices may not be able to visualize the screen a patient has a vital capacity of 4200 ml an frc of 3300 ml and uh, expiratory reserve volume of 1500 ml what is the patient's residual volume option a 2700 B thousand eight hundred, C thousand five hundred, and D three thousand seven hundred. I'll close the poll in another five seconds. This is the response. Again, I am very happy that the sixty-six percent have given the uh, correct answer. So here the B is the correct answer. I have given vital capacity only for uh, diverting them. 
but they have answered very nicely 66% that has nothing to do with that because it is only frc minus erv so we are really very happy people are answering very nicely so we move ahead to the question number 4 again i'll uh, read out for those who are joining from mobile devices the results of a pulmonary function study on a patient indicates the that the vital capacity indicate a vital capacity of 3600 ml an frc of 2000 ml and a residual volume of 1000 ml what is the total lung capacity i'll wind up the poll in another 5 seconds okay it's easier to describe now sir <laughs> it is excellent <laughs> so 95% has given the correct answer it is excellent so that result uh, as the question number increases the correct answers also increase so this 95% is the uh, they have given the correct answers so the most intelligent uh, audience okay so the next question question number 5 which of the following would be the most would be most consistent with an obstructive disorder option a if we even by fc percent greater than 80% predicted option b 15% improvement in bronchodilator challenge c increased uh, peak expiratory flow rate option d total lung capacity values of 55% of the predicted i'll wait for a few more seconds now the answers are coming thick and fast Yeah, I'm winding up the poll. So uh, we are happy that the seventy percent have given the correct answers. Option B is right. Now I will give a suggestion. That is suggestion. My plan was some people will do pinky pongy technique, pinky pinky pongy, and they will select the A or B. They just like that. So I have planned all option B are right answers. So even for the residents who have failed, they can check. for all the questions option b is the right answer so they have given i am happy the majority more than 50% they have answered it correctly once again i thank the indian college of anesthesia okay i think one more question question number 6 a patient has a pre bronchodilator fev1 value of 2.5 liters per second and a post bronchodilator value of 3 liters per second what is the percentage change Sir, actually, I have given the clue already. So, <laughs> no point waiting for the poll report. We have plan now. Everyone will give yeah. the correct answer. See, eighty. The even then it is only eighty-nine percent instead of previous question is ninety-five. So mm -hmm. already we have uh, given the answer. So we have okay. fixed B as the right one. So I thank uh, Dr. Shani for the wonderful uh, cooperation in projecting this. Thanks. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi, for the excellent simulation. Also, thank you. Okay, I request Vijesh to introduce the next speaker and go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for the next talk on basic airway management, uh, I wish to introduce Dr. Sanish P. J. He is a senior consultant from in anesthesia and critical care at Anandapuri Hospital, Trivandrum. he is the coordinator of uh, the indian college of anesthesiologist webinar platform his special interest is e learning in anesthesia he is the founder of the youtube channel anesthesia tools and he has a webinar platform that is the webinar campus he has authored a review in clinical anesthesiology for postgraduates and a textbook for anesthesiology for the anesthesia technicians and he has many publications in index journals over to you dr sanish Uh, thank you dr vijesh for the kind introduction i thank the indian college of anesthesiologists for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to take a lecture on an important topic actually physiology of uh, respiratory physiology we have divided into three modules and uh, this is the last one so we thought of introducing or incorporating airway management also inside this uh, basic um, basic science chapter exam free agree um actually for anesthesiologists airway is the most important thing and uh, i would be happy to um give a short description on basic airway management 
I bring greetings from my institution and in the very hospital and research institute, uh, Trivandrum. I don't think many of us uh, will be wondering what is airway management. The day you enter this specialty as a resident or even during your internship, uh, you'll be knowing what is airway management. But actually, it's a vast ocean and uh, there are uh, too many gadgets, too many devices, too many logistics things involved in airway management. Actually, that is the strength of us as anesthesia, anesthesiologists. That is uh, airway access and venous access are our specialities. Airway management comes into action when we discuss about the evaluation, planning of airway management, use of medical procedures and devices, and our aim is to maintain or restore ventilation, which is an all important um, skill in our specialty. When do you come across airway management? When you land up in a scenario with acute airway obstruction, as case of respiratory failure, and mostly in elective scenarios or controlled environment like administration of general anesthesia. Remember the key skill is the first step that is anticipating and recognizing respiratory decompensation. ASA close claims project and uh, UK's fourth national audit project clearly mentions that uh, failure to assess for and identify potential difficulty or application of poor judgment in management planning may contribute to a poor outcome. So before anesthesia, anesthetists should be able to answer the key questions like, will I be able to do mass ventilation? Will I be able to perform laryngoscopy directly or indirectly? Will I be able to intubate this patient? Is there a significant aspiration risk? If I predict difficulty, should I secure the airway awake? Can I access the cricothyroid membrane if required? And uh, probably how will the airway behave at extubation? Okay, that is the time when you give the airway back to the patient. Airway equipments, uh, we have different categories, simple airway adjuncts like oral and nasopharyngeal airways, supraglottic airway devices like laryngeal mask airways, um, eye gels, intubating LMAs, laryngeal tube, a lot of uh, equipments are there in the category two. Infraglottic airway devices, uh, including endotracheal tube, preformed endotracheal tubes, lung isolation tubes, and so on. So for this uh, webinar discussion, I have opted not to deal with the equipment per se, because I believe all of us should be familiar with what all equipments available with you in your institution and your uh, troubleshooting skill set. Basically, I would like to concentrate on how do you prepare for an airway management. Here actually, uh, last uh, few years, our focus has been shifted from tracheal intubation to a broader perspective of oxygenation and ventilation. Okay. So we are emphasizing on the utility of uh, back ma uh, mask valve ventilation, use of extraglottic devices, tracheal intubation using direct laryngoscopy and indirect laryngoscopes, as well as other alternative techniques, visual and non-visual, including invasive surgical airway in managing the airway. So what are the questions that uh, have to be addressed? You should know what is difficult airway. A difficult airway is defined as a clinical scenario in which a conventionally trained anesthesiologist experiences difficulty with face mask ventilation of the upper airway, difficulty with tracheal intubation or both. Difficult face mask or supraglottic airway ventilation. You say it when it is not possible for the anesthesiologist to provide adequate ventilation because of one or more of the following problems like inadequate mask or uh, supraglottic airway seal, excessive gas leak or excessive resistance to the ingress or egress of gas. Difficult supraglottic airway or LMA placement is defined when 
the placement requires multiple attempts in the presence or absence of a tracheal pathology. Difficult laryngoscopy. It is not possible to visualize any portion of the vocal cords after multiple attempts at conventional laryngoscopy. You already should be familiar with the cormac lahane grades. We are speaking about higher grades like uh, three or uh, four. Difficult tracheal intubation. When the tracheal intubation requires multiple attempts in the presence or absence of tracheal pathology. Failed intubation. When the placement of endotracheal tube fails after multiple attempts. We are actually concerned about these two scenarios, CVCI, that is can't ventilate, can't intubate. CICO, can't intubate, can't oxygenate. These two are deadly scenarios. This emphasizes the, uh, the stress on evaluation of the airway in anesthesiologist practice. The intent of the airway history is to detect medical, surgical, and anesthetic factors that may indicate the presence of a difficult airway. You need to check the previous anesthetic records if available in a timely manner, which may yield useful information about the airway management. What was the cormac lehane grade last time? What was the indication for intubation and uh, with what gadget they were able to secure the airway or whether they had to go in with a cricothyrotomy or an elective tracheostomy all this important information will be helpful for your ongoing airway management. Your physical examination of the airway should include some looking up for uh, some non-reassuring findings. And on a big list, I think uh, some of them will be um, this uh, relationship of maxillary and mandibular incisors. We speak about the overbite. Um, the visibility of uvula, this malampati class, all these things should be done in a structured manner as per your institutional protocol. The short neck, the thick neck, obesity, all these things will give you an indication that you may be encountering a difficult airway management. So I would like to introduce you to some uh, concepts involved in the airway management, which will help you understand the rationale behind the use of some of the gadgets and when to use and all. Three axis alignment, two curve theory, and the three column model. So what is the optimal position for direct laryngoscopy? You speak of it as a sniffing the morning air breeze position, ear to sternal nose position, which involves neck flexion, atlanta occipital extension. A neck flexion of 35 degrees and a face plane extension of 15 degree is cited as ideal in most cases. This position was originally described by Chevalier Jackson as the boys Jackson position and as early as 1913 and it was termed sniffing position by McGill in 1936. And what is the three axis alignment theory? You can see the oral axis, pharyngeal axis and laryngeal axis. And uh, once you position with a 10 centimeter pillow, the two axes will try to get aligned. And there is still a questionable alignment regarding oral axis, which will be managed during your laryngoscope manipulation. The optimal position for direct laryngoscopy brings the laryngeal axis, the pharyngeal axis, and the axis of the mouth into alignment with the line of vision. Again, I would like to indicate that in 2001, Atnet et al. showed using MRI that this is not achieved by the sniffing position itself in non-anesthetized volunteers. In fact, unless the patient has a flip top head, such alignment is anatomically impossible. But it gives the best possibility of alignment of these three axes. How about the two curve theory? The primary curve is the oropharyngeal curve. You can see that in uh, green. Secondary curve is the pharyngoglottotracheal curve. And the point of inflection is the base of the epiglottis. The tangent of this position point is the laryngeal vestibule axis. Successful laryngoscopy and tracheal intubation requires alignment of both the curves in the line of sight and trachea. The head lift flattens the secondary curve Head extension further flattens the primary curve. So sniffing position does both. The laryngoscope 
completes the flattening of the primary curve. Now something on the three column model. This was developed by Keith Greenland in, and, and published in 2008. It groups the anatomical structures that affect the airway management into three columns. You can see one, two, and three, posterior, middle, and anterior. A framework for uh, assessing the airway and prediction of difficult airways, and this helps to predict which devices are useful for intubation. We'll come to that. First, we'll start from posterior, posterior column or posterior complex. This comprises of structures posterior to the upper airway, particularly the cervical spine, this affects the ability to position the head and neck in the optimum position for laryngoscopy. The optimum positioning requires flexion of the lower cervical spine and extension of the occipital atlantoaxial complex. Greenland actually describes it as the static phase of laryngoscopy. Again, posterior column, it uh, deals with the assessment of range of movement of the atlanto-occipital joint or flexion extension. In a conditions like ankylosing, spondylitis, cervical spine, fusion and all, posterior column is limited. And the suggested devices in such cases will be a hyperangulated blade video laryngoscopy, direct laryngoscopy with McCoy blade, LMA as a conduit for, with bronchoscope and uh, ion tree catheter or intubating LMA when posterior uh, column is in question. Middle column is the air passage. Any pathology affecting the lumen of the airway compromises the middle column. The assessment usually comes from the history and examination like uh, history of hoarseness of voice, strider, etc. Radiological evidences like uh, CT MRI and nasopharyngoscopy. There'll be examples of uh, middle column or air passage compromise like foreign bodies, tumors, infections, laryngeal edema and all. But here blind attempts are not encouraged. So suggested devices will include uh, standard blade video laryngoscopy, direct laryngoscopy with the Macintosh blade, LMA as a conduit with bronchoscope and eye entry, catheter, avoid intubating LMA. So blind attempts might complicate the scenario. Coming to the anterior complex or uh, anterior column, this is a triangular shaped pyramid that contains submandibular space, glossal muscles and laryngeal skeleton. It has vertices at the temporomandibular joints, the lower incisors, and the apex at the hyoid. The upper border is formed by the superior surface of the tongue. So assessment will include the thyromental distance, TMJ to TMJ distance, TMJ to incisor distance. We look for overbite or uh, retracted mandible or micrognathnia, and malambity score also assesses the anterior column or anterior complex. The anterior column is displaced by laryngoscope when it is placed in the mouth and moved to expose the glottis. Okay, this is important because, and uh, Greenland actually described this as the dynamic phase of laryngoscopy. The anterior column is affected by any pathology that decreases the size of the pyramid or decreases the compliance of the tissues within it, as well as the range of movement at the TM joints and the stylohyoid ligament. What is important to note is these examples of anterior column compromise would be something like micrognathia, Ludwig's angina, hemorrhoid, post radiotherapy, forward protruding upper incisors or relative micrognathia, macroglossia, etc. Here, mostly advice will be hyperangulated blade video laryngoscopy because conforming to the primary curvature of our visualization would be better rather than to compress a non-compliant anterior column in some cases. Direct laryngoscopy with straight blade may be advised. LMA as a conduit with a bronchoscope and entry catheter. Here actually we need to avoid McCoy blade or avoid intubating LMA because uh, of the change in the um, consistency or compliance of the anterior space structures. Anyway, in any case, additional evaluation may be indicated in some patients to characterize the likelihood or nature of the anticipated difficult airway. How do you prepare your plan? The basic preparation for airway, difficult airway management would be, yes, get the patient and their relatives into confidence, ascertain that uh, you have the best possible resources in your institution with you, and at least uh, one capable assistant or supervisor with you in difficult airway management. 
preparedness is the key in handling airways. Administer face mask pre-oxygenation before initiating the management of the difficult airway because pre-oxygenation basically gives you more time, more leverage with oxygen reserve. So that you should not miss out. Uncooperative or pediatric patient may impede opportunities for uh, pre-oxygenation, yes. Act actively pursue opportunities to deliver supplemental oxygen throughout the airway manage difficult airway management, be it uh, through nasal cannula, oxygen, face mask, or uh, chaffency, or any other additional device. Why do you need to do airway assessment? We are actually seeking to predict if we can manage what patients normally do for themselves. That uh, evicts spontaneously breathing patient, they maintain their gas exchange, maintain their airway patency, they protect their lower airway against aspiration of the foreign material. Once we start our intervention, these functions may be compromised and it's your responsibility to maintain those functions. So airway assessment helps you to uh, inform the clinician's choice of intended primary plan and rescue approaches. You should always have plan A, B, and C. Plan B and C should be strong. And again, it helps to determine if any additional preparations are required during the implementation of plan A. And again, when you consider the extubation of an intubated patient, you need to again have a thought on the airway assessment. Again, it's a cognitive forcing strategy, the airway assessment uh, uh, protocol, to get one thinking about the possibility of encountering difficult airway in any patient. The lack of documented airway assessment has been cited in medical legal cases as falling beneath the standard of care. Unanticipated difficult airway cause more catastrophes as per the closed claims product. And what should we screen for? We should screen for the patient history, examine the notes, as I mentioned again. It's a multifaceted uh, strategy. You need to have a holistic approach involving history, physical examination, sometimes radiological evaluation as well. And what should we screen for? Airway assessment should also screen for difficulty with pathways other than the intended technique. You should also check whether your plan B might uh, come across the difficulty. Like in case of using a uh, supraglottic airway, one should also screen for difficulty with face mask ventilation and tracheal intubation. When tracheal intubation is the plan A, one should screen for difficulty with face mask ventilation and supraglottic airway use. Some advocate evaluating all patients for potentially difficult emergency, potentially difficult emergency front of neck airway access, the FONA. Others doesn't require that uh, everybody should be prepared or screened for a front of neck access. Again, predictors of tracheal difficulty with airway dif uh, instrumentation we are screening for, whether any uh, out of the ordinary physiological threats to the patient's safety exist, that might impact a decision on how to proceed. This is called physiologically difficult airway, which is also important because the airway may become physiologically difficult in cases like intolerance of apnea due to compromised uh, functional residual capacity, increased oxygen consumption, or high minute ventilation requirements, a case of full stomach because of the risk of aspiration and hemodynamic instability. In such cases, unless you have a meticulously planned airway management, you might come across difficulty in securing the airway. You should also check for the readiness of your skilled assistants. Your clinic, a clinician's experience should be checked and lack of desired device due to reprocessing or repair is also important. Just because you had a fiber optic bronchoscope a month ago, which has gone for service, will not give you a reassuring plan. This is the uh, picture we have projected in our clinical club meeting uh, as early as in 2010, when our fiber optic bronchoscope was uh, taken back by the company because it was uh, not moving with the alignment. So we have posted an obituary for the uh, fiber optic bronchoscope that time. Yes, administration also should uh, give you a hand in giving the um, required infrastructure. Anyway, after that, uh, we got uh, one more, uh, actually two more fiber optic bronchoscopes in our institution. Again, I would like to stress the role of uh, ultrasound in airway uh, assessment planning. Point of care ultrasound is uh, coming thick and fast, even in the STLS recommendation that is um, mentioned. Okay, so once difficulty is predicted, what now? 
An additional margin of safety may be afforded from instrumenting airway in the airway, spontaneously breathing patient, and manipulating under topical airway anesthesia. These three will have its own advantages. The safety benefit increases from having the patient himself or herself maintaining the gas exchange, maintaining the airway patency, and maintaining the protection of the lower airway against aspiration during our airway in instrumentation. The need for awake tracheal intubation is suggested by findings such as anticipated difficult or impossible direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy. This either alone or in conjunction with other predictors of difficult airway management like predicted difficult face mask or uh, supraglottic device ventilation, apnea intolerance, high risk of pulmonary aspiration, lack of ready access to desired equipment or skilled help, everything will point towards a plan A of awake tracheal intubation when the facility agrees. Okay, so in a case where you have originally planned with a supraglottic airway or regional anesthesia might be more safely managed with a controlled tracheal intubation, awake or after uh, induction of GA with an appropriate preparation if difficulty with airway management is predicted. Suppose you have an upper airway pathology and you are trying to contemplate a laparotomy under spinal anesthesia, there is always a question whether in case of a extended duration of the procedure or an inadequate uh, neuraxial block, what is your option? That time you will be in a hurry and your airway management uh, strategy is likely to come across more complications. So securing the airway in such cases would be a better idea. Here actually intubation or securing the airway takes a higher priority. Conversely also it might be true if airway assessment suggests difficulty, one could revisit whether the case originally planned under GA could be feasibly and safely perform, be performed with a regional technique if the right conditions prevail. Okay, this is not applicable to cavity invading procedures, but if you can successfully manage with the superficial procedure, periphery procedure with the regional technique, you need not tamper or play around with the airway management. Airway assessment might simply suggest the need for extra care during implementation of originally planned technique. This might include uh, additional maneuvers like reverse Trendelenburg patient positioning, use of high flow nasal oxygen, having extra equipment or a colleague standing by in the operating theater. Our practice, has the airway assessment really come of age? We are only starting to recognize the need to assess the physiological or contextual predictors of hazard to the patient during airway assessment. Few national airway guidelines have yet contemplated providing meaning, meaningful guidance on how most safely to proceed with uh, when difficulty is predicted. There are different uh, difficult airway management guidelines. As you can see, the red zone is overlapping there is no clear consensus and uh, some guidelines start with uh, intubation or uh, face mask ventilation. So it's basically depends on your institutional uh, protocol. That means the, your skill set, your infrastructure available and uh, your uh, expertise, the plan Bs, which will everything will lead on to a final planning for a particular case. So should we give up on routine formal airway assessment? No, definitely no. We can at least teach a structured approach to airway assessment. We can indicate the factors that should be considered. We should continue to study whether the combination of some or all these factors into multifactorial tools that will more successfully predict difficulty with airway management. Now I will uh, come to the audience. This is a question for the audience. Pick out the non-reassuring findings in airway management. Okay, there are uh, five options. I'm launching the poll window now. Just click on whichever you feel are non-reassuring during your airway assessment. Swelling or scarring of the neck. Option B, micro or macro nathia. Option C, previous history of difficult intubation. Option D, a case of retropharyngeal abscess. Option E, cervical spine injury. I'd be happy if uh, more of the audience uh, will come forward with their uh, opinion. 
yes one third has already answered i'll wait for five more seconds because we are running um, ahead of our schedule yeah i am ending the poll yeah i think 50% agree that uh, swelling or scarring of the neck is non reassuring yes micro or magnanathia though 22% said yes i would go for it this is a danger sign previous history of difficult intubation definitely yes i'm surprised why only 42% um, opted for that because even the uh, compiled risk index system previous history of difficult intubation scores much ahead of our uh, individual indices retropharyngeal abscess is a known uh, background for uh, difficult intubation so you need to be prepared to tackle with a mid column compromise in the three column model i have described before cervical spine injury again it's a posterior column uh, issue again you will have pos uh, positioning issue you have limitations you might even increase the airway compromise or cervical spine injury with your airway maneuver so you need to have other options like uh, uh, fiber optic intubation or uh, ilma uh, aided uh, intubation without uh, moving the neck much okay so all are non reassuring uh, findings to me okay we'll uh, wind up with uh, 10 commandments in airway management i think uh, all the residents should be familiar with the 10 commandments airway management does not mean intubation now we have uh, all lot of maneuvers supraglottic devices and other strategies like niv hfnc so whenever airway is compromised don't jump into the conclusion that you need to uh, go ahead with the laryngoscopy and intubation Uh, number 2 oxygenation and ventilation are the top priorities it's not the intubation we somehow maintain the oxygenation maintain ventilation until probably if you are hard pressed you secure the airway but your priority should be oxygenation and ventilation be an expert in bag valve mask ventilation don't underestimate the value of bvm whenever you are transporting a patient drowsy sedated or even post operative patient at least you have a bag valve mask with you so in case of any unanticipated or anticipated airway problem you can institute positive pressure ventilation using that simple device preparedness is the key to success number 5 no at least one rescue technique you should have your reserve plans strong otherwise uh, when your plan a fails you will be in trouble okay develop a personal airway algorithm i have already mentioned it depends on your skill set your equipment available your help available and your institutional protocol because if you don't have a fiber optic bronchoscope don't uh, wait for it till some catastrophe happens you should know which are the next in line gadgets available make a sensible uh, airway algorithm in line with the accepted uh, recommendations don't let ego get in the way just because uh, you are doing the case when you had uh, one two or three attempts at uh, laryngoscopy don't let your ego get in the way declare an a difficult airway scenario and get in help call for help at the very earliest phase when especially when you are coming across an unanticipated difficult airway ego has no place in managing airway um, airway management in anesthesia use capnogram or uh, esophageal detector device to confirm every intubation even if it's a acls uh, mega cord or case scenario the moment you put a and don't recall to confirm that tube is in place then proceed otherwise the esophageal intubation may be the reason for sustained hypoxia and uh, lack of ventilation nine is very important when seconds count don't count on seconds that means in an airway emergency each second is important so whichever you think is the best one your first choice should be instituted as first don't think that let me try this out first then if it doesn't work i'll go to the better plan so your best plan should be instituted at the earliest so when seconds count don't count on seconds practice airway management skills personally i would advise that uh, the plan b plan c like fiber optic uh, intubating lma video laryngoscopy you try in normal airways so that you'll be confident attempting it in actual difficult airway scenarios so airway management remains one of the most important responsibilities of an anesthetist poor airway management has been recognized as a serious patient safety concern for almost uh, last uh, few decades also 
since the consequences of an unanticipated difficult airway are potentially catastrophic proper education and training are a con uh, continued necessity thank you very much for your time and patience uh, we would take uh, the q and a if required at the end of the sessions i think over to you. back to you dr vijesh thank you thank you dr sanish it was a wonderful talk a comprehensive assessment of the airway that you have uh, presented and i think we have a few questions in the chat box from the audience uh, there's a question as you said the difficult airway is defined as uh, uh, the the definition you have mentioned about a conventionally trained anesthesiologist yeah. so the question is what is a con what is a conventionally trained anesthesiologist yeah um, i think uh, most of the index journals uh, will approve our research paper when the airway expertise is at least 3 uh, years of training okay so 3 years of training is required and uh, i think there are some more guidelines that uh, some uh, kind of trained anesthesiologists should be doing this many number of uh, minimum uh, laryngoscopy because basically it's a skill set also so if you are out of touch with the basic procedures for some time yeah that also will count now there's a request of uh, could you there's a request could you explain mm -hmm. the two curve yes. theory um uh, should we do it at the end or otherwise yeah yeah sure you can do it so i have to share the slide again audience poll if you have few questions for the audience pardon Uh, have we got a few questions for the audience no no, no. Uh, i put only one question for the audience yeah that's it no bye why are we take up all the questions later yes yeah sure so we'll move on to the next talk at the end of the talk probably we'll take up the other questions so i would like to next introduce dr uh, ek ramdas who is the chief of uh, anesthetic services at bb memorial hospital at calicut he's a dnb examiner and past president of isa kerala state and he is a dnb examiner for the last 14 years and he is a past chairman pain and palliative care society at calicut i invite you sir for delivering the lecture on advanced airway equipments over to you sir thank you dr sen <clears throat> the outset uh, am i audible yeah and i think yeah, you can move the slide also sir okay thank you uh, i must uh, at the outset thank uh, radhakrishnan sir and uh, of course dr sanish uh, for this invite and also the indian college of anesthetics is a wonderful venture i am overwhelmed by your invite so moving on to advanced airway management it is a vast topic which i don't think we'll be able to finish in 30 minutes and therefore i have uh, taken up some of the few important points Uh, which might uh, uh, be, uh, which might uh, uh, be of useful to uh, all of uh, us listening to this uh, talk um uh, sarish kariyo both us right no okay, i'll do it i'll do it okay so the objectives uh, of this uh, talk is airway assessment in the emergency department in the and also in the icu it is unlike the airway uh, evaluation in the operation room and therefore i will stick to only the evaluation of the airway in the emergency department number 2 i'll talk about advanced airway devices especially video laryngoscopes and fiber optic bronchoscope very briefly and finally touch upon some of the important points which deserve mentioning regarding front of neck access or e fauna next one next one says So coming to the airway assessment in the ED and the ICU, uh, 
it is totally different it is uh, because uh, yeah, there is uh, we are in an emergency situation and assessment in the is a cornerstone to preparing for your emergency yeah, rapid uh, sequence in, uh, in intubation and there is no excuse for uh, its omission here and if you fail to assess airway uh, in the emergency department uh, you have failed in your professional duty it is very important that you assess airway before you do anything in the emergency department uh, there is always time to perform an airway assessment you cannot you cannot say that there is no time and therefore i didn't evaluate uh, airway assessment and like any patient uh, airway assessment it can be divided into history it can be divided into examination and investigations in the ed history and investigations are not always available uh, but you have uh, the physical examination which is enough and more in a situation like this uh, and therefore you go ahead with the physical evaluation of the patient so how will you do it emergency airway management in the emergency department is often challenging because of multiple uh, emergency specific fact factors like patient may be vomiting or patient may be having a facial trauma or a neck trauma patient may be immobilized uh, because of cervical spine or or the patient may be undergoing close cardiac compression and the intubation in such circumstances is not a simple thing it is uh, extremely difficult and uh, therefore uh, and also you cannot get medical history or uh, from the patient or the sometimes there won't there won't be any bystanders by the patient and therefore the situation is uh, totally uh, uh, different from that we see in the operation room where the patients are all uh, done most of the patients are done as an elective procedure and you have enough time to prepare yourself and uh, do the procedure yourself and also in the op operation room you have the wake up and back out is an option you can wake up the patient and back out and say and postpone the case for another day that is not possible in uh, in the emergency department or in the critical care department next slide sanish uh, coming to the the prediction of difficult laryngoscopy in the ed according to the latest meta analysis of prediction of difficult laryngoscopy in the operation room the upper bite upper lip bite is the best predictor that is the thing in the operation room so if the patient can bite his upper lip then probably is airways you will be able to manage his airway if the lower incisors cannot bite the upper lip at all the likelihood of difficult laryngoscopy will be very very high so that is, that is one point uh, number 2 our the the ed patients who require airway management are frequently unable to follow commands they will not they, they, they will be either unconscious or they'll be uh, del del delirious or they'll be not responding to you therefore the difficult laryngoscopy assessment tool for the ed emergency department setting should be very precise concise and can be undertaken without patient cooperation what do you do we have the lemons criteria and you can use the same lemon criteria but here in this concise lemon criteria you exclude malambati score if you exclude malambati score and then use the criteria then it indicates that the absence the absence of any item in the in the criteria indicates the absence of typical laryngoscopy with high sensitivity sensitivity also remember you can use the 11 criteria uh, but of course you like to uh, exclude malambati score in that criteria this is uh, the uh, next one please this is the uh, the lemon criteria here you have uh, you all know about it the evaluation criteria uh, look externally evaluate the 332 rule you score of the malambati score and uh, o for obstruction and for neck mobility and the total is 10 so this criteria you remove the malambati and then you evaluate and then find out the difficulty next one please so coming to the, now having finished the assessment i have briefly talked about the assessment now coming to video laryngoscopes what is it uh, how how is it important to us so coming to video laryngoscopes the miller and mckendosh blades were introduced 
way back in 1940 several years ago miller introduced it the first one the straight blade laryngoscope uh, that was in 1941 and two years later sir mackintosh introduced the curved blade that is the one we use uh, often in the operation rooms and everywhere and in the 1990s uh, 1970s uh, the the fiber optic intubation scope came into existence and in 1990 bullard and u scopes were introduced and since 2000 there are several video laryngoscopes uh, available to us like glide scopes air track pentax c track and magnus so there are several different types of video laryngoscopes available to us now and we should choose something which is uh, uh, cost effective and good uh, for your for our use so if you now coming to the video laryngoscope how do you classify video laryngoscope it can be classified basically into two uh, like those with macintosh type blades and those with hyper angulated blades there are only two types macintosh the conventional macintosh curved blade and those with hyper angulated blades the hyper angulated blades are again uh, divided into non channeled and then channeled so there are two in the hyper angulated ones next one please uh, so this is uh, the, the the lowermost one is a conventional one that we what we use routinely in our the operation room uh, which we are all familiar with the middle one is the uh, well, laryngoscope is the macintosh uh, middle one is a video laryngoscope with macintosh blade uh, wherein you can see the visibility is far better than that of the lowermost one the one which we use uh, routinely and the most uh, the, the topmost one is the hyper angulated video laryngoscope wherein you can see a wide uh, area uh, and therefore uh, it shows the anterior portion of the trachea and also behind Uh, so if you look at the laryngoscope the hyperangulated ones so one look better than the remaining two so coming to the next one so next slide please so so we have a number of uh, uh, video laryngoscopes available some have disposable blades uh, there are new devices uh, with better resolutions then there are anti fogging technology some of them are also suited for pre hospital airway management uh, and uh, so therefore there are several uh, so there are some are channel some are non channel and therefore you must know at least few of them which is better suited for your environment and choose uh, that uh, based on your need next slide please so There is a, there is a, this is uh, the Stoes C Mac blade. This is the one which we use. It is exactly like our uh, conventional blade. If you look at the blade, it is a Macintosh blade. The only difference is that it has got a camera at the tip, and also it has a monitor at the other end. So there is an anti-fogging system also. Uh, wide view is possible. We can also record static images. and it can also be used for con conventional purpose conventional as a conventional laryngoscope so this is the one which we use uh, because we bought it quite early and that, therefore that is the one this is the, again the same picture uh, uh, showing the monitor and also the the uh, the blade and the handle next one please next slide uh, sir this is uh, from left to right the left one is the original glide scope with its angulated blade to 60 degrees the middle one is a macintosh blade which is size 4 and the last one on the right extreme is the uh, the magrath mac video laryngoscope with a similar profile to the standard macintosh blade so the, here if you look at this the original glide scope it is hyper angulated the remaining two are the conventional type macintosh blades this is the glide scope with a next one please glide scope with a preformed endotracheal tube using a stylet if you using a glide scope since it is hyper angulated you need to uh, shape your uh, the endotracheal tube in a way that simulate the curvature of the 
making those of the as a hyperangulated blade. The endotracheal tube is preformed to match the angulated profile of the gyroscope blade. Then only you can negotiate it through the vocal cords. So the, remember this. This is the difference. You have to have the. How do you do it? You have to have a stillet through the endotracheal tube. Now this is the one is the on the uh, left side is the for this screen is the uh, ultrac optical laryngoscope and on the left. And the, the, on the right side is the Pentax airway scope uh, with their channel design. Both have channels. We have the channels. We have air track with us, but because they are, but they are disposable and you cannot use it for a long time. Uh, the endotracheal tube is loaded into the tube for a guide in a position in which the tip will not obstruct the optical view. You can see the endotracheal tube along the uh, curvature of the blade. So you load it before you start intubating. And as you see the vocal cords and the uh, larynx, you negotiate it in between the vocal cords. That is how you do it. Uh, so that is the one. So these are the most common ones. So what are the advantages of video laryngoscopes? Video laryngoscope has a series of advantages over standard approach. It produces a better magnified view because of bigger resolution of the glottis. And, and also along with that, it, the projection of the view to a monitor, it, it facilitates coordination between the assistant and the performer of the intubation. It makes teaching easy. And it also helps the assistant if, they, if, they, if uh, the intubation is required, uh, pressure on the, uh, the uh, required. And therefore there are several advantages to it. There is also minimal minimized levering of the upper teeth. So, what we usually, when you use a McIntosh blade, there is a lot of levering on the upper teeth that you can exclude. They can, that won't be there in the, while using this uh, uh, laryngoscope. So there are several advantages to it. Uh, and therefore, it is always uh, better to have it in a difficult diverse situation. So these are some of the important points which I would like to mention regarding the, uh, the video laryngoscopy. So when you have a video laryngoscope, there are some important points which you have to look at. First of all, if you take an equipment, whatever the equipment is, look at the functionality of the equipment, whether it is working. Then only you can have it, because if you have an, a difficult time where you cannot run to repair it, and therefore you have a functioning uh, device by the side of you. So you look at the device, it should be functioning. Number two, you look at the mouth and insert the blade. So you, well, while doing that, you don't look at the monitor, you look at the mouth and insert the, the blade midline. You don't have to sweep the tongue, uh, unlike the, what we do in the, in the, with the traditional or the conventional laryngoscope. Uh, and then look at the screen. Look at the screen and uh, introduce the endotracheal tube into the mouth. And when you intubate, you look at the screen. So the insertion of the video device should be midline, just as you would use uh, for a bronchoscope. In that way, we get a better view and more space for maneuvering the endotracheal tube. It is also easier to stay midline as there is less chance for getting lost. There is no need to sweep the tank as a video laryngoscope has a camera on its distal lens permitting an expanded indirect view of the glottis opening. Okay. And therefore, one has to be to look into these important points while using a video laryngoscope. So that is uh, briefly about the video laryngoscope. Now coming to the uh, next slide, please. Flexible fiber optic endo endotracheal tubes, endotracheal intubations. Uh, how is it different? So this is uh, not uh, a very, very, this has been introduced quite some time back before the video laryngoscope. We have been using it since several years now for difficult laryngoscope, uh, but uh, it is not meant for emergency situation. It is meant for an elective situation. It has got an eyepiece. It has got an, is a, a ring for focusing. It go, it's got a control lever, working channel port. It has got a body, an insertion cord, a light source, a suction valve and port. And it works on the principle of total internal reflection. The light travels through a bent tube. So it, it is as per the as per physics, 
we have learned that light travel in a straight line. But here, light travel uh, because of total internal reflection and from wall to wall it travels. So this is the equipment. Uh, I hope it is there in most of the hospitals now. Um, so this is the one. So here, the importance here is that you cannot use it in an emergency situation. Next one, please. Next slide, please. So the primary indication for uh, 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 fibrotic uh, uh, bronchoscopic intubation is the elective manage management of the anticipated difficult airway. When endotracheal intubation is required and there has been a history of previous difficult intubation, or if difficult direct laryngoscopy is predicted on airway assessment, and uh, or when mask ventilation is also predicted to be difficult, then bronchoscopic intubation can be an invaluable alternative intubation technique. And therefore, it is not meant for emergency. That is one point which you have to remember, not for emergencies, but for elective planned situation. Next one, please. Uh, so the, what are the general recommendations here? Here, when you're using a, a, the fiber optic uh, bronchoscope for intubation, you must remember that the learning curve for intubation is quite long. Uh, you have to develop it in patients with normal airway first. And you must have done at least 10 successful single attempts in less than two minutes to do independently. So it takes, it takes quite some time. So you learn it in normal patients. Uh, you can also um, learn it with uh, pulmonologists. They quite often do it. They do it on a uh, daily basis. So you can go with them and learn it, how they do it for uh, tracheo, bronchiotracheal suctions and all that, and learn how they do it. And then you practice it in your patients. So it requires time, but once you have learned it, then it becomes very easy. Next one, please. So, so this is, uh, I just picked up one point which uh, uh, is very important because uh, uh, once we had uh, uh, spoiled our uh, scope because of this, uh, that is the optic fiber, fiber must be grasped only with two fingers. That is a thumb and the index finger. If you use three fingers, there is a possibility of it breaking because those this contains uh, fiber glasses and it breaks very easily. Though it bends, it cannot kink it. It is only as gradual bending and you cannot hold it with forceps or it cannot, because quite often if you are using a towel clip, you put it, put a towel and clip it with a uh, towel clip and then it's gone. And it's quite expensive also. And secondly, must not be lubricated with gels or lignocaine spray. You should use only normal saline or distilled water. So these two points, I think, is very important because uh, quite often we find people using, uh, doing this, and therefore I uh, put up this on the screen. Uh, so coming to the next one, next slide, please. What are the problems? There are problems. It requires time to set up, and therefore only in elective situations. It needs space to pass through. The patient cannot open his mouth at all, or the nostrils are blocked, they say, because of a tumor, then you have uh, you cannot uh, use this. It is absolutely useless. And also, blood. More than, more than the secretion, if there is blood in the upper airway, then again, you cannot use it. And lastly, pharyngeal abscess, which is a relative contraindication, because the abscess can break and then produce problems. So these are one of some of the problems which uh, uh, are important when using a fiber optic uh, intubation bronchoscope. So having finished that, uh, now let me pass to the last part of the topic, that is emergency front of neck access, or is also called as e -fauna. What is it? Uh, what is e -fauna? Uh, Emergency front of neck access, it is a life-saving intervention in airway management, uh, if there is a delay, it can produce brain injury and even death of the patient. It has been already described by Sanish how important uh, airway management is. It is important to identify cricothyroid membrane before airway. So every patient, any patient you come across, before you start intubation, see where the cricothyroid membrane is, especially when you anticipate difficulty. Uh, that is very, very important because in obese individuals, it's quite difficult to find out the cricothyroid membrane. In lean people, it's quite easy, but uh, obvious, it's quite difficult. Uh, and uh, there should, you should take uh, training uh, in uh, the 
e folder that is very very important for the analysis because we are not most of the analysis are not very familiar with the technique and therefore because it comes once in a lifetime but uh, when it strikes it strikes like a lightning and therefore uh, take training in e folder next one please so e folder what is the definition uh, e securing of a patent airway via the anterior neck to facilitate emergency alveolar oxygen so oxygen is oxygenation is extremely important if we do not oxygenate it takes the, in one, one to two minutes the brain will die and therefore it is extremely important it is an emergency situation and therefore this has to be done and it is the final life saving step in airway management it's extremely important to master this technique or uh, attend classes on this what are the indications uh, they can't intubate can't oxygenate uh, scenario situation occurs after attempts to manage the airway by a face mask a supraglottic airway device and a tracheal tube uh, during those situation uh, you need to have this uh, e folder in the icu cardiac arrest and death secondary to hypoxia from failed oxygenation uh, during airway management can typically typically occurs and cause death to the patient and therefore uh, there are indications when is when it becomes very difficult to intubate and oxygenate a patient then you have to go ahead and start uh, doing e folder how do you do it and just go briefly along the next uh, few slides so how do you perform e folder first of all to it is done on the cricothyroid membrane and therefore you have to identify cricothyroid membrane in all patients before induction point number 1 and then to identify the cricothyroid membrane by two techniques one the laryngeal handshake technique and number two the ultrasound identification there are two techniques which are described the first technique is a laryngeal handshake technique wherein you the laryngeal handshake uh, it is described in das 2015 guidelines the index finger and thumb grasp the top top of the larynx there is a greater cone of the heart bone and roll it from side to side and then the bony and cartilaginous cage of the larynx is formed which connects to the trachea and then the trachea the, the fingers and thumb slide down over the thyroid lamina the second picture uh, shows that the fingers and thumb slide over down over the thyroid lamina and in the last picture the middle finger and thumb rest on the cricoid cartilage with the index finger palpating the thyroid the cricothyroid membrane so you feel the thyroid cartilage just behind below it caudally you feel the cricoid cartilage in between you get the the cricothyroid membrane it could be uh, difficult in obese individuals in the what do you do you have another uh, you have to use some other method to identify it the cricoid rings and the cricoid cartilage are sometimes referred to as uh, next one, next one please so this is a second method which uh, uh, one can use that is the ultrasound uh, for the identification of the uh, thyro uh, cricothyroid membrane so how do you how do how is this used okay uh, if you when you put it on the uh, on the front of the neck uh, you can see uh, the string of pearls in a long if you put it longitudinally the tracheal rings and cricoid cartilage are sometimes then and therefore the 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 cricoid cartilage is at the top which is larger than the other ones the tracheal rings it is marked here and on top top post is the thyroid cartilage so the role for ultrasound in a difficult situation is reserved for scenarios where there is both the immediate availability of ultrasound machine if you don't have this and if you don't have the expertise to do this then it is useless so if you are expert in doing it and it is available by the head the, by the patient side then you can use it and if you look at this you get this uh, pearl string of pearls you can practice it in your patients even if you don't want to do a uh, uh, airway thing in a normal patient you can see visualize this um, the string of pearls and then identify it then it becomes easy and when you come across a difficult situation so that is it so coming to the next one uh, there are three methods techniques described for e folder 
one is a scalpel cricothyroidotomy second one is a cannula cricothyroidotomy and the last is a surgical tricostomy these are two ones scalpel cannula and surgical the scalpel next one scalpel cricothyroidotomy scalpel bougie tube this is how it is expressed scalpel bougie tube it is recommended as a first line technique this is a first line technique remember this is a first line technique fastest and the most reliable uh, uh, equipment and the equipment required are required a 10 uh, scalp a 10 size scalpel a bougie a cuffed tube so your trolley should always have this equipment a 10 scalpel blade a bougie and a cuffed tube 6m mid uh, so this uh, are important in doing a scalpel cricothyroidotomy how do we do it provide 100% oxygen Uh, maximally ex extend the neck, uh, then establish full neuromuscular blockade, identify CTM. Next slide, please. Next slide, Sanish. Next slide. This is next slide, no? CTM. Yeah. Yes. Put a transverse layer. So once you have identified the the the, the cricothyroid membrane, put a transverse stab incision. Put the blade should be transversely placed. Put a stab incision. Then turn the blade through 90 degrees. The sharp edge facing caudally. Then put a, a bougie through the gap into the trachea, and then railroad lubricated six mm. Uh, tube with cuff to the trachea and then inflate the cuff, ventilate, confirm the position and secure the tube. These are the steps. It looks very simple, but identification of the cricothyroid membrane is extremely important. So you just stab the trachea at the cricothyroid membrane and then turn it, put a bougie and do this. Next slide, please. Uh, if you don't, if the cricothyroid membrane is not palpable, then what do we do then? If, if it is not palpable, you have to make a vertical incision. Instead of putting a stab on the trachea, put a vertical incision from caudal to the scaphalate and uh, use a blunt dissection with fingers and do the remaining things as I've already described for the palpable one. Identify and stabilize the larynx. Proceed for the palpable as for palpable cricothyroid membrane. Put a bougie and then railroad it. So if you are not, that is if the patient obeys and you are not able to palpate the cricothyroid membrane, you have to put an incision and do this. Next slide, please. So these are the steps uh, shortly, very briefly. So uh, the, uh, palpating the cricothyroid membrane and there is 100% uh, oxygen is being given. Put a stab just perpendicular on the trachea and then rotate it 90 degrees in the third picture. And the picture D, uh, a bougie is passed. And then in the last picture, the bougie is uh, railroaded by a, a, a six mm tube and the cuff is inflated. This is how you do uh, uh, like the uh, uh, bougie technique uh, with a scalpel. So coming to the next one, next slide please. So this is uh, the second method. There's a first method is always a, a bougie, uh, the puncture bougie method. And the second method, which is described is a cannula cricothyroidotomy. It's very simple, it looks, uh, but again, there are problems with this. What is it? You have to, you have a cannula of two to four mm, a cannula with a needle. Uh, the problem is that you require trans jet ventilation. This is the problem. It's, you should have that equipment and that equipment can be sometimes, you know, can produce problems to the patient, can produce pneumothorax and you know, various other problems. And therefore, that should be, uh, uh, it's an important point which one should remember. If it is a wide bore cannula, a 14 mm cannula, then you could be able to ventilate conventionally uh, without using the trans jet ventilation. So, cannula cricothyroidotomy is the second method. The first method is always the one that, which I've described. The second method is a cannula cricothyroidotomy. Next one, please. So this is, these are the steps. Same, it looks very, yeah, almost 
similar to the other one, but the only thing you are not using a knife here, you are using a needle and a cannula, and the cannula is uh, you you connect a syringe to the cannula, and you, when you find air bubbles, syringe with saline. When you find air bubbles, then you are sure that it is in the trachea, and then uh, you to the cannula, you either pass a guide wire or you whatever the larger cannula and then connect to, connect to a conventional one or a trans uh, trachea jet ventilation, what, whichever is available to you. So if it's a larger cannula, you can use a conventional ventilation. If it's a smaller one, you won't be able to do it. So cannula cricothyrotomy is involved, puncture of the uh, membrane, cricothyroid membrane, and it requires all these steps to do it. But it is a second one. This first one is always the scalpel method. So the last one is the emergency tracheostomy. That is the last one. Uh, this is uh, again, uh, it is, it, the, uh, this, this one takes a longer time than the surgical cricothyrotomy. And most situations, it should not be undertaken as a first line attempt at e-fauna. So don't do it uh, without doing the other techniques. It requires specialist equipment. The tracheal interspaces are deeper in the neck. So if you have, you have to, if you're doing a tracheostomy, you can't do it at the cricothyroid membrane. You have to go to the uh, second or third tracheal uh, spaces. So there you have the brachiocephalic vessels or you can have the trachea uh, deeply situated and therefore it needs experience. And therefore it is usually done by surgeons. Anesthetists are not very familiar doing it uh, unless they practice it in patients uh, because it's deeper in the neck and there is a potential presence of major vessels. Okay. Therefore, only it is only performed by experienced operators and when everything else fails, that is the last choice. So these are the three methods of uh, airway management, front of neck access. And now coming to the last slide, uh, I just summarize, advanced airway management techniques, they require significant training, it requires skill, and invasiveness, and therefore one has to be well prepared. You cannot prepare it when a situation arises. Advanced airway management, it requires right equipment. You should have the right equipment. You should have at least one video laryngoscope. You should have, if you're doing an elective one, you should have a fiber optic endoscope. So these should be there with you. It, the advanced airway management, it encompasses various techniques performed to create an open or patent airway. So in short, uh, I've made it very brief, only a compre comprehensive overview of the whole you know, topic. I uh, think it is uh, give, uh, given a proper uh, justice to the topic. Thank you, Sanish. Back to Sanish. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that uh, wonderful talk. And... Uh, so, with the, uh, I would like to ask you a question regarding the, during this COVID time, people, the guidelines say that we have to use a video laryngoscope. Uh, do you think that there is a learning curve for using these video laryngoscopes? Because now people are running helter skelter for a video laryngoscope. Yeah, there, there is there is a learning learning for video laryngoscopes uh, because it is not it is but it can, can be learned faster than the fiber optic laryngoscopes. Uh, it doesn't require. Uh, and it's easier than the conventional ergoscopy. Conventional ergoscopy it requires more, it is more difficult than the video ergoscopy. If you learn it, it is easy. But it, it has some uh, learning curve, but it's of course uh, better than the conventional one COVID patients because you can stand away from the uh, airway and looking at the screen and intubate. It, it does take some uh, learning curve, but it's easy compared to the other methods. Dr. Sanish, there was a request for uh, from one of the panelists to describe the uh, two curve yeah. assessment okay. Okay. of the two curve okay. error. Yeah. My slides are visible? Yes, yeah, slides are visible. Okay. So uh, these are the two curves we were describing. This is a primary curve, which is uh, used uh, along the oropharyngeal curve. Uh, anatomical structures and the secondary curve on the pharyngoglottotracheal um, pathway. So these are the two different curves, one 
angulated like this and second one angulated like this this is the vertex it comes almost towards the base of the epiglottis so what happens is when you put the patient on sniffing position the head the lifting of the head itself reduces the curvature of the secondary curve and when you extend the neck at land occipital thing again this curvature is minimized actually sniffing position achieves both as uh, mentioned by dr ramdas the biggest difficulty with our uh, direct vision is light travels always in a straight line so unless these structures are aligned in a straight line along our visual axis we won't be able to visualize the structures glottic structures here so our idea is to get this curvature flattened as much as possible so that our angle of vision which comes like this will be towards the glottic aperture now in the dynamic phase once you introduce the laryngoscope here and maybe push away the tongue and glottic structures along the line of the laryngoscope blade once you push this uh, submandibular base of the mouth structures anteriorly then this curve will be more uh, flattened and uh, you will have a uh, almost direct vision into the glottic aperture what our video laryngoscope does is the scope blade itself has uh, conforms to the curvature primary curvature and actually our vision starts from this point actually dr ramdas has shown a good graphic also actually our vision starts from this point so direct in line with the vision from this point gives you the glottic aperture visualization rather than uh, during our conventional scope is the anesthesiologist of the uh, visual axis will be somewhere here so it has to be aligned but if you start uh, looking from this angle uh, this uh, new um, laryngoscope video laryngoscopes will bypass flattening of this primary curvature what i would like to stress is since some conditions where there is a ludwig's angina or a macroglossia compressing this curvature by your laryngoscope to make this primary curve flatten will not work and it might be counterproductive if the abscess bursts it can uh, spoil the airway exposure all together if it is a uh, hemangioma the blood in the scene worsens your view and uh, your further visualization will be a bigger challenge so in such cases a device which conforms to this primary curvature will be a better choice like a, a fiber optic bronchoscope or uh, our um, new age video laryngoscopes with curvature conforming to the primary curve will do the trick otherwise for conventional laryngoscopy we need to straighten the primary curve as well as uh, the uh, secondary curve a little bit to make the visual axis in line i think i have uh, explained uh, dr vijesh you would like to add something on this yeah that is that is fine uh, there was another question whether this is applicable to the pediatric population also this two curve theory yeah um, actually the pediatric anatomy airway anatomy is slightly different overall it might confirm to it but uh, there are even otherwise normal anatomical difference like angulation of the uh, glottic aperture is different the level of glottis is different and the glot uh, occiput or the head size is comparatively bigger so in um, such cases the uh, the problem we uh, come across will be much higher the curvature will be uh, all the more bigger challenge especially when it comes to the primary curvature again um, conventional laryngoscopy if you look at it um, if you are using the straight blade you have a narrow aperture vision into the glottis because you are unable to um, manipulate the the anterior column structures too much in the pediatric age group thank you thank you sanish uh, baljit sir any comments from your side nothing i think uh, he has explained it very well and all the speakers have done a great job Uh, one of the reason for the primary curve, uh, excessive primary curve in case of pediatric age group is a large tongue, so that's what makes uh, uh, it, it it worse. Uh, with regard to the secondary curve, there is not much difference over there. It is primarily the primary curve which is uh, to be dealt with, and that's the reason that uh, you know we use straight blade one to lift the epiglottis, um, uh, the tip of the blade, and secondly, 
uh, since it is the blade is narrow, so uh, we have a channel of vision, uh, you know, and and the tongue is displaced. So we don't need to displace the tongue as much as we uh, need to displace in adults. So a small part of the tongue is displaced, and that's good enough because uh, once we see the glottis, uh, I think there's no problem with that. So just a bit of addition to Dr. Sunish, a wonderful uh, explanation he has already given. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. BRK, sir, any any comments from your end? Well, I have nothing to add. Murli, sir, any comments from your side? Uh, yeah, I put my comment about uh, uh, ten them. comments were commandments were very well done. All of them are important, but I thought I should put the seventh commandment first. If there is uh, expected or predicted difficulty in intubation, you must have a friend who should be readily available to help you before you start the case. That is one. Second is, if you have encountered difficulty unexpectedly, you must call for help right then and there. You must call for help then and there. That's why I would like to put that as the first commandment. This is my comment, of course. This is to highlight that uh, when in a panic situation, you will not be able to intubate, but your friend who is not panicked will be able to intubate. So when you are in difficulty, must call the must call for help immediately. This is my suggestion. Thank you so much for including me in the discussion. Thank you so much. Very much, sir. Thank you very much. JC, ma'am, comments from your end? Very well conducted seminar. And uh, I think most of the queries of the students would have been solved by the vivid explanation given by our speakers. And uh, Yes, I agree with the, Dr. Murlidhar, as he has said, that it's so important that we inform and call, call for help. That's the primary thing and the most important thing. And of course, as a video laryngoscopy, yes, it is recommended as uh, the, the choice for intubation, but there is a learning curve, of course. So thank you very much. And it was very interesting. Will Baljit, will you wind up the session? Yeah, sure. Uh, I am uh, extremely pleased to uh, thank all the speakers. Uh, they had wonderful pre presentations. Uh, what I'm a fan of uh, is uh, the slides, the way uh, Dr. Sneesh prepares. Uh, Sneesh, you win me over on this. Excellent slides. And not only excellent slides, uh, excellent explanations also. Uh, you know, from the, uh, you know, uh, point of view of presentation of the facts of uh, the subjects. All the three speakers have done a great job and my sincere compliments uh, to them. On behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists and the president and the CEOs, uh, myself and Dr. Jashiri Sur, I thank all the speakers and of course, all the, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, chairpersons of, uh, uh, of this uh, webinar. Thank you so very much. And I leave it to uh, Dr. Radha Krishna to please uh, uh, say goodbye and good night uh, to all the participants. Thank you. Good night. We'll all see you next week, same time. Good night.